Welcome, everyone, um, to the Spring 2015 Distinguished Public Policy Lecture. I'm David Figlio. I'm the uh, director of the Institute for Policy Research. It's great to see so many people here today. Um, um, as uh, I see uh, some people I haven't seen before, as well as many familiar faces, so just as a quick reminder, um, the point of IPR is to help to uh, bring together people from across the university, our faculty and students and uh, postdocs and staff who are interested in the most important public policy, especially social policy related questions of the day. Um, we're a very vibrant, active community that is interested in both uh, conducting and catalyzing top quality research on social policy issues, as well as um, uh, stimulating conversation. And we do that in a number of ways through our uh, Monday uh, lunchtime colloquia, which you're always welcome to, uh, to join us in, um, usually at the Transportation Center at the corner of uh, Foster and Sheridan, uh, to a number of different events like this one. Um, I, uh, my main job, besides the fact that I'm going to uh, interview our esteemed guest in a moment, uh, my main job now is to remind you to turn your cell phones off, please. Um, and I'd also like to uh, introduce my, uh, my friend and colleague, Lindsay Chase Lansdale, uh, who's also currently uh, uh, doing a terrific stint as associate provost. Um, um, we are very proud of Lindsay and also miss you every day. So uh, we're very happy that you uh, can uh, come and introduce Jim. So thank you all for coming, Lindsay. So I am delighted to introduce James J. Heckman, who's the Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. In 2000, as many of you know, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on microeconomics of diversity and heterogeneity and for establishing a causal basis for public policy evaluation. He's received numerous other awards, too long to list here, although I'd like to note that he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's actively engaged in conducting and guiding empirical and theoretical research on skill development, often called human capital, in addition to key, the key topics of inequality and social mobility. And he also happens to be one of my heroes. I'm a professor of human development and social policy and a developmental psychologist. So I'm loving the fact that Jim Heckman is the founding director of the Center on the Economics of Human Development at the University of Chicago. And that's the title of his talk, I believe, unless you've changed it recently. Conversation. <laughs> Conversation. On a personal note, I had the pleasure of being a colleague with Jim when we were on the faculty of the Harris School of Public Policy at U Chicago, and I enjoyed learning about his research on job training of youth and adults. And then he turned his sights to early childhood education, a spectacular decision for many fields of science and for our society. He's had an enormous influence on my own fields of human development and developmental psychology, and I well recall more than 10 years ago when he came over to the bright side, leaving behind the dismal science, and coming to present his research at the top association in my field, the Society for Research and Child Development. The IPR Distinguished Policy Research Lecture clearly involves an eminent researcher who has had major impacts on policy, and I'd like to emphasize in the last part of my intro Jim's influence on policy and programs. Since becoming an expert in the short and long-term impact of early childhood education on life opportunities, James Heckman has dramatically changed the public discourse, the policy debates, and the government decisions, all for the better. He's been a game changer. And I thought I'd just give you a quick little illustration. This is what's happened in the last several years, just to give you a feel for what's going on in terms of public discourse. Do we invest in preschools or prisons? You may be surprised by the states that support pre-K. Pre-K, the great debate. And last but not least, lifelines for poor children that Jim wrote himself and appeared in the New York Times about 18 months ago. 
he also had this conclusion, early investment in the lives of disadvantaged, disadvantaged children will help reduce inequality in both the short and the long run. So I am delighted that you're going to engage in a conversation so we can hear about all the stages of the life course and what you see about them, as well as your views on parenting, cognitive development, and what I believe you occasionally call non-cognitive skills, but which I call socio-emotional development. Please welcome me. Please join me in welcoming Jim Heckman. All right, so in addition to making sure your cell phones are off, I just want to tell you just a little bit about the rules of engagement. Um, so we're going to uh, be um, chatting for the next 45 minutes or so or until, uh, until Patricia tells me to stop. Um, um, and then uh, from then on, we'll have the opportunity for you to ask questions, uh, I guess, uh, Patricia, there's going to be a mic uh, that's going to be passed. Is that right? Okay, so just raise your hand, and one of our folks will come. Uh, please make sure you in, uh, you uh, introduce yourself so that we know who we're talking to as well. Um, so, perfect. I liked very much Jim's slides, right? I mean, I was thinking this is a conversation with with uh, Jim Heckman, but it's nice that he is having a, it's reciprocal, so he's having a conversation with me. He's much more interesting to listen to. Um, so Jim, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you've been a personal hero of uh, mine for a long time, and uh, uh, a betting man's favorite for uh, the first economist to win the Nobel Prize a second time for uh, yet another uh, set of outstanding uh, research uh, that you've done that Lindsay was describing. So one of the single most, you even brought this, uh, one of the single most compelling diagrams I've seen in social science is a graphic of yours. We, we can oh, here show, you want to we can show the graphic. Okay. Oh wait, here we can go. Yes. We can go, there we go. This there graphic um, that shows the declining rate of return to investments in human capital with the biggest returns accruing to prenatal investments and the rate of return um, declining as people age. It certainly paints a very strong picture in favor of large-scale early investments in children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Could you please tell me a bit about the evidence that's led you to draw this fundamental conclusion? Well, let me first of all explain this diagram. And this diagram is not a, uh, a literal evaluation of each program at each stage, nor does it say that schooling can't have a high return or the job training can't have a high return or anything of the sort. What it does is it captures an idea, and actually Lindsay was right in sort of talking about uh, when we were together at the Harris School, uh, I was working on job training and it was kind of a depressing time uh, looking at the programs we were looking at, the Job Training Partnership Act, Bob Lalonde was there, and uh, there were a lot of studies that suggested, at most, very modest improvements. And if we thought, you know, there would be any kind of, uh, of, of, of chance of kind of helping disadvantaged people, that the job training avenue just didn't seem to be working out that well. And that kind of motivated what led to this diagram. But the diagram itself is a hypothetical experiment. So let me explain. I think it's backed up by facts, but let me explain what this diagram means. First of all, it's something that is looking at the beginning. It, it's, it's looking at a child's lifetime and doing a thought experiment. And it's asking the experiment, suppose you have a dollar to invest. One dollar. Where would you find it most productive to invest that first dollar? Now, there's some technical conditions that if you, you know, if you, maybe you want to put a dollar at every age and then ask where's the next dollar that you invest. So to avoid kind of singularities and things that have to do with uh, uh, things near zero. But the logic was the following, and this turned out to be something we formalized and found evidence for, both econometric evidence and program evaluation evidence. But the idea is something which economists call dynamic complementarity. That sounds very formal, it sounds very, uh, very obscure, but what it's really saying is kind of formalizing the idea that skills are dynamic. And that a skill base created today launches skills and creates it, makes it easier to invest in the next period and the next period and the next period. So skills are creating, skill investments today percolate over the whole life cycle. 
and they create a base. And because they create the base, they make it possible for you, for individuals, to gain substantial returns over the whole life cycle. And it also avoids the need to remediate. So for both of those reasons, in the sense of prevention and remediation, we see enormously high returns for early life conditions. So, and we know that from kind of extreme situations. Uh, there, are, there are some studies which are ones of true deprivation, where people are locked up in closets or you know, out raised in kennels with dogs, young children, or a little less dramatically, but the Romanian infants that were kind of. And we see that an extreme deprivation in the early years can lead to lifetime consequences. But we also know, and I think we have both econometric evidence and I would argue program evaluation evidence and a lot of non-experimental evidence, which I would put together in this diagram to support this empirically, you get very, very high returns uh, in the first stages of life. And some of the most extreme evidence would be on things like fetal alcohol syndrome or some of the uh, uh, insults that would be, you know, drug smoking even uh, when the mother is carrying the child. And we've learned that from biological studies and so forth. Now, you know, each one of these studies is not converting itself directly into a rate of return. But what we've learned is that multiple skills interacting with each other over the life cycle produce this notion of a return that accumulates. And it's not just that you're getting compound interest. It's that you're able, precisely because of this dynamics of investment, to actually create uh, to have much greater opportunity, much higher rates of return later in life. So let me give you an example. Uh, we know from some estimates that have been done in the past that rates of return on college education for able children, for motivated children can be, like in college, college going, college graduation, can be very high. Sometimes for very smart kids and very motivated, 15, 20 percent people have estimated. Now, there's some range there. But we know you can get very high returns. So this diagram doesn't say that college doesn't have a return. But what it says is that ability, and it's based on the notion that ability matters a lot in whether or not you get benefits from these returns down the life cycle. That's also true about job training. Some job training programs put in place for motivated children, put in place for bright, intelligent children, you know, the German apprenticeship programs, programs like that, have been shown to be having substantial returns. But what this says is that we can precisely build a skill base, and it's more than just compound interest. It's growing at a rate faster than compound interest, which is why the opportunities are so uh, great and why it's higher than what the opportunity cost of capital is. And, and, and what it is, it's creating the skill base, avoiding the problem. So it's the dynamics of skill formation, skills begetting skills. And then there's a lot of other evidence that supports it. Now, this is also the case where I'm playing God. I'm really playing God with this diagram in the following sense. I am saying I'm controlling the investments in the lifetime of the child. Realistically, parents are playing a huge role. Schools are playing a big role. To really ask what is going on, we really need to evaluate all the other inputs that occur over the lifetime. And we know you can get very high returns to schooling for able and motivated, not just college, but other returns. But it suggests that, and also parents play a very important role. So a lot is abstracted from. But I still think the basic biology and neuroscience and the economic and the social analysis, the econometric evidence, supports the idea of very high returns. So it's just that you're building a skill base, and that build base percolates and creates, it makes it easier to make later investments. So that's something that is 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 fairly obscure idea. In many, it's related to old ideas and dynamic programming, but it really is the sense of what economists would call a recursive structure. You're building the base, and you're going up. But it's synergism. It's a dynamic synergism. But let me just, I'm giving you a long-winded answer, but let me. Great answer. Well, no, but let me, let me tell what the alternative would be. I think if we'd had this conversation many years ago, that many people, and just still do have this conversation, say that able children are the ones who benefit the most. So if you ask who's going to benefit the most from a public investment in education, like, say, high-quality schools, generally kids who are more motivated, more able children, in the sense of giving a standardized curriculum, and with parents who support them, or that's not on this diagram, would actually benefit. So there was a notion of what would be called complementarity. And the notion was, well, you would invest in those kids who are already brighter. That leads to a kind of notion of social Darwinism. And, in, and frankly, at later stages in the life cycle, that's, that's actually some version of that may be true. 
But what it turns out to be is that, yes, there may be very high returns to more able and motivated children, but we can change the base of ability and motivation, and for that matter, health, by life cycle investments. And it's that dynamics that's captured here. And I think that's what was missing in public policy discussion. And so 100 years ago, people thought that these things were genetic, abilities were genetic, and uh, we now know that that's only part of the story. And uh, Chris can, uh, can qu question, but some of the most recent estimates of heritability have suggested very low relatively low heritabilities for children from some of the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And so the, the final part of the story is that we look at disadvantage. So advantaged children are getting an awful lot of good investment. We know that. And we have that from hundreds of studies. So it's not that we are talking about saying that most advantaged children, the children living in Evanston and, and north, uh, the north suburbs I think of as the affluent belt of Chicago, they're getting generally very, very high return, very high investments in them. Where children are not getting much investment at these early stages, which is so productive, is some of the most disadvantaged. And so that also suggests, I think, a lesson, which I think has to be embodied, that it really is this return applies most strictly to people who are most disadvantaged. But there are returns to education and investment all over the life cycle. But th so that's the, that's the general thrust. Too long an explanation, but I wanted to try to put those two pieces together, three pieces, really. Well, thanks, Jim. And in fact, actually, uh, this is uh, one of the major raison d'etre of IPR is uh, we have a group of people here who are really focused on trying to uh, lift the hood, so to speak. I mean, people, uh, some would say, get under the skin or uh, uh, see, what's see what's really going on to try to understand what are the fundamental causes and consequences of inequality. So in that regard, you did 10 times better than I could have to motivating uh, why it is that IPR does a lot of the things that we do. Um, you know, one of the things that I have had to deal with a lot is um, I've, been, I've been talking in, uh, recently to policymakers in some uh, in in a number of different settings where these are policymakers who are seeming to take look at diagrams like yours and um, and say, okay, I understand we need to invest in early childhood, so instead we're going to take money away from, um, from high school or post-secondary and the like because they think it's just not worth investing in the human capital of adolescents or adults. I know you don't believe that, so what, what should I tell them? I mean, I, I try my hardest to tell them some of the things that you're, you're, you're saying. Uh, well, give me better ammunition. Well, part of the ammunition comes from some of the recent studies that have been done about the benefits of early evaluation. So for example, a group in Utah working, you know, some people, Goldman Sachs and others working uh, with, uh, with the school system there directly, a group of people have actually documented, or they're in the process of documenting in a rigorous way, that the savings that came from investing in early childhood, especially for disadvantaged children, were more than paid up, more than made up in the short term in the sense of reduced special education costs. Now that's not a general argument because a lot of schools, a lot of states don't have such great expenditure on special education. But the fact of the matter is that that's a, that's a statement saying not only does it pay off rapidly, but it also pays for itself and pretty rapidly. So you're not impairing the budget. You're actually augmenting the budget in some sense. So if you spend less on remediation and more, but if you think more broadly about the budget, you think about the state budget, we're not just talking about taking money from high schools. If you look at all of the benefits that have been found, for example, on health, on reduction in crime and so forth, and you start looking at the enormous amount of money spent, for example, in incarceration costs and criminal justice, never mind the transfers of goods from one to the other, but think about victimization costs, that we see an enormous saving that comes. Like several programs that have targeted kind of what, what seems to be the, the cru some crucial years, three to four, when, when uh, you know, the first signs of what, what psychologists would call externalizing behavior, they can be predictors for later, long-term, highly aggressive behavior emerge. When those years are targeted, you see substantial reductions in crime for those children 25, 30 years later if you go over their full career. So again, in the larger social system, you're saving resources. So the idea, I mean, this is a notion of investment. Now I think, Bob Gordon can correct me, but I think the CBO has a seven-year payout period, is that right? Something like that. 
So if you think about saving prison 20 years later, then the notion would be, well, uh, we can't, um, we shouldn't, I mean, that to me is a very short-sighted thing. But if you take a longer view of public policy, which I think we used to take, and I think we should take, that actually these will have enormous, I mean, will have substantial benefits, especially for the disadvantaged. And, you know, there are a lot of books that have been out, are coming out now, more are coming out. For example, Putnam's new book, uh, Charles Murray had a book about coming apart. And there are other studies of this. Uh, Sarah McClanahan had these studies years before. But really showing separating classes and separating groups. And you really are getting a group of children who seem to be getting a little detached from the larger American society. And with it, creating problems of social inclusion. I would argue even problems of what the future of political life of the society might be. But certainly when you look at the economic and social benefits that you see substantial advantage, and there's benefit. So it's not just a question of saving money or transferring. It's not a fixed budget. I think we could even have a reduced budget, actually, if you talk about a total budget across all sectors. In other, some recent work we published in Science last year showed substantial effects on, uh, on health. Be savings that we, we're quantifying that right now. It's been much more difficult. And if any epidemiologists are in the audience and know about how to use biomeasures at 35 and map them into reduction in costs at age 65, I'd be very anxious to hear them. We're in the process of doing that. But uh, what we see is substantial. This is a program, the ABC program that we studied, that was originally launched to boost the IQ of disadvantaged kids. So this program now, these kids are now 40, 45 years of age, randomly assigned. We actually had medical examinations taken of these kids and they're 35 years of age. And we find substantially lower uh, blood pressure. We find substantially lower indicators uh, of things like uh, certainly the, the so-called Framingham index of heart conditions, metabolic indicators, conditions that were preconditions for diabetes. I can't remember. It's actually a slide here. I Actually, I can't help but advertise it here. Uh, right there. There, there it is. Um, but you can see, and this is from a paper we had published and went through quite a, a lengthy refereeing process on, but it's uh, uh, it, 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 it actually are real effects and translating those into lifetime effects. So, and so what's the mechanism? See, this is the other part of the story. And she was talking about non-cognitive skills or maybe social and emotional skills. A lot of this is self-control and the ability to stay on. These skills were frequently separated. People thought of health care. ABC program, from which these data are extracted, was originally designed to boost the IQ of low-income children. Just IQ. That was like 40 years ago, 45 years ago when it was launched. And now we've come to understand that the nature of these interventions is such that they're boosting this whole variety of skills. They, they, they interact with each other. They produce this dynamic synergism I talked about earlier. And now we can see manifestations in health. So in public health components, you can actually see uh, real improvement. I think this will, from our preliminary estimates, these are substantial benefits to the economic case that was based on earnings and crime. But the broader question is really thinking about skills in this inclusive context, not just IQ, not just achievement skills, not just even social and emotional skills or grit putting together these skills and understanding the dynamic interaction. Once you do that, I think you're going to see huge consequences for policy. So one calculation we made, admittedly, this is off the, you know, this is kind of a back of the envelope calculation. But we looked, we took some evidence that Levitt had made some 10 or 15 years ago about the cost of reducing crime. Um, and uh, this was in terms of what it cost to train a policeman in the city. You can reduce a certain amount of crime. We took those numbers and said, OK, now, there are other ways to reduce crime. One is high school graduation. So if you just simply ask, what are the benefits from high school graduation, uh, in terms of high school graduation, and how much does it cost relative to training a policeman, we found that about, you could do substantial reduction, like at 20%, 10% of the cost, get exactly the same benefit in terms of reduced crime. So if that's true, I mean, again, that's to be really pinned down. Christoph was you know, thought was got a little too excited about that, but it's. It, I think there is some hard evidence on that, and uh, but I do think that this uh, means that there are social savings, and I think then it's too short-sighted. Whether or not we can make that argument now in the current political environment, I don't know, because people are only talking about costs. It's kind of amazing. 
I think at one time people only talked about benefits. <laughs> now we're only talking about costs. But I think when you put the cost and the benefits together, they're still going to be substantial for a range of these programs. So, yeah, no, that's that's uh, that, uh, that's, that's really great. Um, so you know, some of your related to something you just mentioned, Jim. Some of your most compelling recent work involves the GED program, and in that you demonstrate that GED recipients are just as smart as high school graduates who don't go on to college, but have labor market outcomes that look like those of high school dropouts. What would you say explains this disconnect, and what do you think this means for education policy in America? Well, this uh, this work on the GED came with a graduate student. Uh, at the time, he's now long gone, Steve Cameron. Um, and it, it arose just out of a visit. And, you know, again, going back to what Lindsay was talking about, job training. I was actually evaluating, part of an evaluation of a job training program, and that was in um, Corpus Christi, Texas. Actually, several sites, Fort Wayne, Corpus Christi, and so forth. But I decided to go down to Corpus Christi and actually see the training program, what was going on. And I never forget, I, I visited this site, stayed there quite a few days, a few days anyway. It was with MDRC, this very, uh, very uh, important and, uh, and highly qualified uh, organization. So MDRC and I, us, we went down as a group, a few of us anyway, and we visited this program. Well, the reason why I'm mentioning all this is that uh, one of the big components of the, of the program was the GD, which I didn't know much about. I'd heard about it, but I didn't know much about it. And they were showing we were getting big benefits of getting big, uh, big gains from the GED. So I said, oh, this, is, this is really quite interesting. I really want to uh, understand what this program is all about. Uh, and so I did. And, I, and then at, at the Corpus Christi, I got this miracle story. I said, in six weeks, eight weeks, we can train people to pass the GED exam. These are people, these were primarily Hispanics. This was in the valley, the Rio Grande Valley. And these are dropouts primarily, uh, who had sixth grade, maybe seventh grade. And in two months, maybe three, we can bring them to high school proficiency. They can pass the GD. I said, this is a miracle. See, think of it. He, why do we spend six more years in school if we can do a GD? <laughs> and I remember coming home, and my kids were still pretty young, and I told them about it. And they both wanted to take the GD. They said, I, I, can, I don't have to sit around. And they, you know, they're going to lab school, but that was kind of tortured. So I, I just got interested in it. Uh, well, they actually, they weren't going to lab school at that moment. But, they, but, but the point is, is that, that this was something that mystified me. And it, the whole, so we found, we wrote this paper early on, a volume in honor of Jacob Mincer's retirement, really, a retirement. But, but, but we basically just did a, an evaluation, and we thought about this, and uh, we showed that really the GEDs were forming at the rate of high school dropouts. I thought it was an interesting fact and was useful to know. We kind of let it lie fallow. And then I started working in early childhood programs. And I really realized, and I did this work with a, a person who was a postdoc at Chicago at the time named Yona Rubenstein. And he and I, he was working with me. We talked off and on. Roland Fryer was around, actually, at the time as well. And, but this is primarily with uh, Yona Rubenstein. And we, uh, we, uh, we said, well, you know, what, what, is, what accounts for these GEDs? And we started looking, and we started looking at measures of staying with tasks, you know. And in fact, in almost every dimension, the GEDs were um, uh, were basically uh, uh, dropping out. They dropped out of high school. If they were in uh, uh, going into uh, marriage, they dropped out of marriage. If they got married at all, they're much less likely to stay married. They dropped out of jobs quickly. The job turnover rate was there. They seem to be, so we started thinking out loud and said, well, maybe, you know, and this is like a trait. They just seem to be deficient in this trait. Well, meanwhile, I began this work that Lindsay was talking about. I was looking at the Perry study, and I was mystified by the fact that we seemed to be finding, the literature found this before we really looked at all the data, strong economic returns, but there was no IQ effect of Perry. There's no IQ effect. I said, wait a minute, that's very interesting. And then started, ah, oh, wait a minute, then. Non-cognitive skills. So I, suddenly, I got fascinated with the notion. <laughs> sorry, social and emotional skills, or <laughs> whatever, I, uh, personality traits. I will whatever it is. Um, uh, but or dark matter. We talked about that. That was uh, from another conference here at uh, Evanston some years ago. But 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 the structure. But but then it started realizing. Well, there are these other skills. We didn't typically think about them. 
And that's why I got back interested in the GD. The GD project took forever. I started this project like in 1992, and we finally published a book on it in, I guess, what, 2014. So that's, that's showing a lot of, I guess, uh, persistence anyway, <laughs> and, and maybe stupidity, since, since the book is way too academic and has hundreds of tables, and uh, only uh, the, the readership is, is probably quite limited. But, but nonetheless, I felt this was a learning exercise that showing, finding that, the, so we actually started developing measures of non of these social and emotional skills. Sorry, you can correct me. Uh, and we started well, seeing, well, they, they really are deficient. She's persistent. And, no, it's correct. I understand. I mean, there's no skill that's, that's truly non-cognitive. I mean, the beating of the, you know, the, the medulla might be, or there might be some, some, some functions that don't have a lot of cognition. There might be. But, uh, but the fact of the matter is that, uh, that, that suddenly this started coming together. And then we started measuring both these social and emotional skills in the, in the early childhood programs. We realized this is a huge issue. And of course, in the early childhood literature, this had been a component that people had talked about. But then when we went to Perry, we found, miraculously, we started working with the Perry Preschool group. And we looked at the early records. And we realized they were teacher evaluations of what you could think of as deportment, how children. So we could actually measure not just the cognitive skills that they had measured, but the non-cognitive skills, both parent reported and teacher reported, which actually turned out to be more, more predictive. And we could see substantial boosts in these social and emotional skills produced by Perry. And a lot of other work in, in, in early childhood really showed that effect. So that the GD kind of got me onto this. So I never dropped it. But then I realized there was an independent phenomena that at the time, the high school, we we're talking about this at lunch, the high school graduation rate, if you properly count, if you take GEDs and count them as high school dropouts, the high school graduation rate for the United States was actually either stagnant or declining, the high school graduation rate. And so the GEDs were getting to be very powerful. At one time, 18% of all high school graduates in the US were GEDs. So this became something that I think was really important. So that led to this book and led to a series of studies where we started going. So this is showing the fact that I'm easily distracted. So we talked about these social and emotional skills, but we also talked about the GD program. Why did it persist? And in the face of evidence that was pretty negative, going back 20 years, I, I worked with a person at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Lois Quinn, who had written on this in the Wisconsin system. And uh, we kind of worked up as a team when she published a very nice history of the whole GD program. And it led to some interesting questions. And you know, she's, she, she's very, she has a conspiratorial interpretation. You know, until recently, the American Council on Education was the, was the proprietor of the GD. So the, the, this is the very, this is the group that was representing schools, uh, high, schools of higher education, or all of the universities in America. So a lot of the financing of that organization came from GD sales. And meanwhile, we were showing that the GED not only had no effect, but that introduction of GED and it gradually spread. I know I don't, you probably don't want me to give you all the history of the GED, fine. but no. But but what was interesting was that the, the test started after the Second World War. It was the veterans qualifying test, and it actually took veterans who had been in the army three or four years. They'd taken all those courses that were offered to veterans. They had stayed the course for four years, and it certified they had those skills. So. The early crop of the GDs, or what became the GDs, uh, were really quite successful. Then gradually, this test got spread out. You know, became entered in the civilian life in the late 40s, early 50s, percolated. California was the last state to introduce it. That was in the 70s. And what happened then is that the GD started gradually being brought into high schools. So literally, there was an option given to some of the the, the weaker students to get out, especially in the period of high stakes testing. The GD wouldn't qualify for a high stakes test, right? That was ruled out. But you could take them off the books. So in some sense, you could still get a, a, an advantage. So literally, the GD was introduced. So we did a series of studies. And literally, we found, for example, in Oregon, where high school GDs were introduced, the high school graduation rate was declining. There was actually a California, when they introduced the GD, a lot of people started taking the GD instead of graduating. So we said, not only is this misleading, and you know, it turned out that a lot of the convergence, a big chunk, maybe 20, 25% of the convergence of black education to uh, uh, white education uh, in the, in, measured in the 80s and 90s 
was actually due to prison-administered GEDs. I mean, literally, the prison really required as a condition for parole. If you got the GD, you got special permission to get out. So we started realizing the federal statistical system was corrupted, and, and actually it was inducing children to drop out of school. So then we got, even we got on our high horse. So we did a series of these studies, and that led to the book. Uh, but the book, as I say, is way too academic. It has no personal stories of anybody. It has lots of tables. It's very dull. I'm very proud of it, but I also realize, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's me, just dull. And, uh, but, but, but actually, though, but it also taught me a series of lessons, which I think are still are kind of interesting. So. For, for those of you who don't want to read the book, too, uh, there's a really <laughs> nice uh, handbook chapter uh, just a couple years earlier that I think uh, the, of yours that, that I think uh, covers a good amount of the waterfront. Part of it, but, but we actually did a lot of work between that handbook chapter and the book. Not to try to boost sales, but, uh, <laughs> but no. What we did is we did a lot more sensitivity tests, and we tried lots of data sets, such as we could. Because we didn't want to just rely on one or two data sets. And so, but of course, all of the, lot, some of the data sets are fragmentary, only part of the life cycle. But we tried to align these different, and then we tried to do a lot of sensitivity studies, just to make sure that it was real. And uh, I, I think it is real. And we did find, by the way, so th th to qualify, and that wasn't in the handbook, that's why I mentioned it. We did find that there was, see, there's an ambiguous interpretation for young women who drop out of high school because they're pregnant. A lot of those girls, actually, are, are very, uh, are relatively bright, and by measures of, of social and emotional skills, pretty highly motivated. Turns out a lot of those women, actually, when they, after their kids start getting to be of age, they'll take the GD, get, go back to school, maybe get the associate degree, you will see some improvement. So the, there's a question which we have a long discussion of. It took us an extra year or two for the book to really kind of say, well, is this causal or is this just some correlation? But there was some indication that there was some benefit. In the end, we didn't think there was a true causal effect, but these women were very highly motivated. And the GD was a lifeline for them. There was no question. So to me, by the way, I resisted that mightily. Because the original studies were on men, and they were very strong, negative. So I basically... It was one of my postdocs and some of the graduate students who kept fighting me, and I'm grateful they did, because I mean, we went through, we, we raked them over the coals to make sure that there was any result for women. I wanted to be universally negative, and uh, <laughs> I couldn't find it. So there was a qualification for those, those girls who were dropping, but they were very highly motivated in other ways, and they were at the top of their class. They weren't, they weren't the bottom of the barrel. This was not a lot of the dropouts who typically were more common among the males. Uh, the, 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 women, the women who dropped out because of pregnancy actually, I think, seemed to get a benefit. Or at least they got the certification that came with it. So that, that again, that really ruins the book sales. Because now it's nuanced. You, know, you can't say this is evil incarnate. This is uh, this partly true and partly false. And that, that is really, ah, uh, that's, that's death. But by that's the life, anyway. too. By the, by the book, anyway. <laughs> Um, so while we're on the topic of education policy, um, so you know, I, I, uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is perpetually up for reauthorization, but I think it actually might get reauthorized sometime in the next few years. Um, how do you think? So you were talking about God view a moment. So imagine that you could uh, be education czar of the United States. How do you think that ESEA should be revised? to be as effective as possible for human development in our society. Well, I mean, do you want to talk about that particular act or just educational policy I think in education, general? well, I mean, it, it's a reflection of whatever we're thinking about. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know, I, I'm pretty sure I know what you think about, say, the last time it was, was when it introduced, say, you know, high-stakes accountability, for example. Right. And I think we learned from the high-stakes, the literature on high-stakes. So we learned two things from high-stakes accountability. People respond to incentives. There's no question they do. And teachers especially under pressure to perform, are very, very, um, uh, are, are very, very uh, responsive. But we also saw the narrowing of the curriculum. We actually saw that, uh, and again, if anything, it diverted attention from all of these so-called soft skills. I use a neutral term, these social and emotional skills. No, but, we, but, but literally, it became so focused that even physics was dropped in some high schools because it wasn't tested. And so, what it led to was a kind of 
I mean, I think in, we, we talk about this in the first essay of that GED book. We talk about the history of American educational policy, starting really from Horace Mann. It's a, it's a whirlwind uh, tour. But if you think about the American common school, I mean, Mann is actually quoted. I mean, he has a, you can quote, to get a quote from Mann saying that reading, writing, and arithmetic is the least of what we teach in school. And th there was a sense of moral instruction, you know, character skills, behavior. Uh, if you read the McGuffey's Reader, if you read a lot of these, uh, uh, of the essays, you know, it became controversial because it was basically Protestant uh, theology, uh, evangelical, well, not evangelical, but at least Protestant Christian notions were brought in, and this became less popular with, uh, as other religious groups became more prevalent in American society. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that that was a big emphasis. I would say the character skills, these, these, these social and emotional skills. And if anything, No Child Left Behind and that whole initiative completely de-emphasized that. I mean, it was literally a test. And see, this is where I go back to Perry. I mean, Perry is particularly dramatic because the IQ effects fade completely, yet the economic rate of return is high, at least within a range, 7 to 10%, pretty high rate of return. Economic, and that's without the health effects, which we are, will be evaluating. You know, we actually, as a side story, we, we actually went back and we're now, we, when one of you started studying Perry data, started working with them, we ended up collecting Perry data at age 50. So I'll be, we will have that data in the next six months or so, we, and with medical examination. So hopefully there's a counterpart here. But I mean, the point is, is that, that I would say that we should go back to this. And I've talked to Secretary Duncan, I talked to others, almost everybody. So Angela Duckworth's work, the work on grit, the word is out there. I mentioned to some about this new book, by, books by, by Brooks on, what is it, developing character or creating character or something like that. So I think the, the atmosphere is out there so that educational policy should be, be broader. But you know, in the last 50 or 60 years, as part of a revolution, and I would even argue a fairness revolution, people said, let's look at test scores, not grades, not teacher evaluations. And we started thinking more and more about this as just an active cognition. So that what we really were testing is knowledge. And even in early childhood programs, oh, that's crazy. We're not, we're not stuffing kids with facts. We're not teaching them the, how to solve quadratic equations at four. I mean, maybe some will learn that. But, 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 but the idea is really building this set of skills and motivations. And that's a much richer notion of educational policy. And it's one that I think is just, look, I mean, this is a case where, in some sense, we educated ourselves to be ignorant. I really think so. because. Think about the nation at risk. All of the progressive governors of the day, all of the governors, you know, Bill Clinton as governor of, uh, of Arkansas and many other people got together and said, we really have to boost test scores. The whole accountability movement shifted in that direction. And I think uh, uh, it, what happened is it diverted our attention away from that. Even though I think people always knew and intuitively know for sure that these social and emotional skills are very important, the view is you couldn't measure them, they're very biased, and on and on and on. I think we have objective evidence now. It's work in progress. People are still measuring it. People here on some very creative work, people around the whole uh, academic environment in many fields. And I think we have measurement systems. The OECD recently came out with a book, uh, a publication, I should say. OECD, remember, is the proponent of PISA scores. They are the measures. They've really done. So there's a new book a new report that OECD issued, I played a hand in it, so, but others as well, and it was basically on the importance of and the possibility of measuring these social and emotional skills and making that as part of the inventory of evaluation and bringing that back into the school. Now that leads to a whole set of controversy because people say, well, should it be religious education? And I was at Notre Dame and six months ago and uh, there were some very devout uh, uh, Catholics who were into Catholic education who thought, yes, indeed, it should be religiously based, led to a whole controversy about whether or not these kinds of skills needed a religious base. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I see no reason why you can't work with religious groups, but I'll do it in a way that's diverse so you can pick your own religious emphasis, not have a uniform focus placed on you. So I, I would actually think I would think we should think more broadly and actually think broader notions of what the skills are that matter and broader notions of evaluation. And I think the notion of broader evaluation, 
I think they're starting, we're starting to get there. California, I think, is now talking about bringing in social, right? That's part of the, part of the agenda. So this is slowly trickling down. I think slowly people are starting to accept that there are other ways to measure teachers and measure students and schools. And, uh, and I think, uh, I already think, I, I'm not very optimistic about that. So if I were a czar, I wouldn't want to be czar for first thing. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm very disorganized. Uh, and I, I would provide guidelines. Uh, but if I were czar, and could at least advisor to the czar, I would actually do uh, something along the lines I suggested. And then think about the separation of the early childhood years from the school is kind of crazy. I mean, that's been the notion that somehow the early years are, are completely different. I mean, there's a political issue that played out in California, whether you want to extend the schools into the early years. I think there's a benefit, actually, of keeping these systems separate. But to also understand that these gaps that are there, I have a, I have a graph on this, so I'll might as well use my graphs here. My time is waning. <laughs> um, but I will show you this. I mean, this is from Brooks Gunn. This isn't my graph. And this is age normalized test scores, achievement test scores. But from her work, you see this traditional story that at age 18, the gaps are there between children whose mothers are highly educated and those who are, you know, high school dropouts. But you also see the gaps, age normalized, are there at age five before kids enter school. And so that a policy that builds schools is also a, a, a policy that gets kids ready for school. And part of getting ready is just is both social and emotional. There are graphs, similar graphs that I haven't put here today, uh, displayed or brought, that actually will show uh, non-social and emotional skills and personality skills. Or those gaps are there in terms of behaviors and self-control. I mentioned externalizing behavior earlier. So I would ask the, 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 the czar, or the czar and, a, and the court of the czar, to actually have a uh, broader conception and to understand a life cycle development process. And, and to understand then also plugging the high schools on into, you know, I mentioned some work that I had of a student who's graduating this year, Tim Kautz, uh, that's very complementary with work being done here, Jonathan Gurin and, and, and other groups at Chicago. But this is a program that actually works with adolescent kids. These are kids in the middle. These are these are kids in the middle of uh, the, the grades, middle middle of the of the distribution. They're not the best. They're not the worst. They're all in the inner city schools, but they're providing they're providing uh, what I would say is mentoring and guidance, and they're following those kids through the the high school years and into college, and they're seeing real effects. And so the, the, I would say the other part I would tell the czar and the court of the czar, that I would think about teaching in a very different way. That I would think about engaging parents and understanding that all of these preschool programs are most successful when they engage the parents. Lindsay's done a lot of work on that now, but there's a lot of earlier work just in terms of the evaluation suggesting programs that galvanize the parents. And the same thing is true at school. You want to get the parents involved in school. In Chicago public schools, I know that there are some schools that lock the doors. Parents can't even get through because they're viewed as being dangerous and they bring guns into the school. So bringing parents in, oh, ah, sorry, we're going on too long. But bringing parents in, measuring broader skills, and then thinking about education in this broader notion of really interaction. So I would take a term from this child development, scaffolding. Parenting and teaching, scaffolding, they're all the same. And so it even changes the way we conceptually think about school investments. I mean, uh, I know Jean Tirol is being honored by uh, Northwestern, I think it was last week, right? He got the Nemers Award, talked with him a bit. If you think about personality, you think about a lot of these traits, you realize that they are determined through interactions. These skills are determined through interactions. And so the idea of the traditional, here's the teacher, here's the student, here's this one-way flow, is crazy. It's a three-way flow. Parents teachers and students, and in, in fostering those interactions. And when we measure them, I'm actually something I'm actively working on now, looking at the data, building models that capture it, much richer than the notion of somehow investment, where these passive little objects are getting read to. This is where you're getting the kid to engage. But it's a different notion of education. The trouble is there are too many ideas there. So the czar, it had to be multiple czars, and I'm not <laughs> sure how it would play it out followed for many years. But I, I think you want a much broader 
conception of education that we do now. I, I think this narrow view of education, and even the way we evaluate education, I think it's harmful. I think it's harmful. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, one, one thing actually that I find really interesting and exciting about a lot of the work that is going on here at Northwestern, both within IPR as well as um, uh, also throughout the School of Education and Social Policy is this notion of reconceiving of what it mean, what education really means. And I think um, there's a lot of, I, I like what you, uh, you could be czar for a while. It would be fine. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I promise you, you might, you might like some of the ideas. <laughs> some of the results probably wouldn't be so good. I'm not a good administrator. <laughs> so, so, of course, I saw uh, Patricia's sign. So I, in these conversations, one of the things I really like a lot is to get a little bit autobiographical as well. So uh, okay. indulge me. Um, so, I mean, one thing that, that the, you know, the very first paper of yours that I read as a grad student, even before I read your contributions to econometrics, um, was your work on the success of the federal civil rights policy on African American economic progress. And you've been making major contributions to knowledge regarding the causes and consequences of racial inequality in America for decades. Um, I was curious, what first catalyzed your interest in this research question? Well, actually, uh, the short answer is, I was, uh, I was born in Chicago. But at some key point in my life, about, um, I don't know, 12 or 13, my uh, parents moved to Lexington, Kentucky. And this was at a time when Jim Crow was still in business. So I remember uh, having this dramatic uh, experience. It, to me, it was like amazing. I just hadn't seen it. Now, it's true. I was living in a suburb. And for all practical purposes, it, was a, it wasn't fully segregated, but it was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty segregated. This was in the 50s. Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, so it wasn't like this was some kind of uh, integrationist uh, utopia or anything. But we went to, to see the actual, so my, my sister and I like to ride buses. And so I remember we went and we decided where we lived at Lexington it was a bus ride to downtown. So we went down and so we loved the bay window at the back of the bus. I thought that was fantastic because you could see the views. <laughs> And I noticed it happened to be a lot of black people back there, but, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, it didn't, you know, it wasn't an issue. And then the bus driver stopped the bus and said, you know, you're not supposed to be sitting here. You're breaking the law. You're supposed to sit up earlier. So I, that was my first encounter. I, and actually, and then some neighbors came in and said, well, we know you're from up north. And, uh, and this is Lexington, which is pretty mild south, actually. But this was still in the 50s. And they said, well, we just want you to know what the, what the, what the racial mores are here in, uh, in, in Lexington. And they explained, you know, we, we really kind of keep races. So that got me very interested in this question. And then, so I must say, I got fascinated with that. And then we, for, for a year or two, we also lived in Oklahoma City, which was also segregated. So you'd go downtown Lexington or Oklahoma, you'd see separate fountains. Most people here beyond, you know, they have to be over 60, I think, at least to see these fountains. You probably saw them, Bert, right? Uh, these, these segregated fountains. No, but you see these benches. You'd go into the park. No, you'd go into the parks. You'd see the fountains. You'd see the, you'd go into the theaters. And everything was segregated. And so I, I was fascinated with this. And, my, and when I went to college, uh, my, my roommate and I, my roommate was a Nigerian. And that was an issue, too. But when I went to college, you know, a lot of people didn't want to room with him. But I thought it was fascinating. He was a Nigerian prince and had all these markings. He was a very smart guy. So we decided one time to go down to the south, and because it was the time of racial turmoil, and so we actually drove from uh, Chicago uh, uh, down to uh, New Orleans. We went down through Birmingham, Alabama, and we went. We started in Lexington. It was a, I had friends there. Went to Lexington, then went down through Tennessee, went into uh, Birmingham, and that was at a time when Bull Connor was still the uh, uh, police chief, and so. We decided we'd just kind of see this firsthand. And he was, so he and I were very, 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 uh, you know, we were close. And he was curious, because here he was in Nigeria. He heard about all this. And of course, you know, at that time, there was a lot of activity in the South. So Selma, and a lot of things we are celebrating now, 50 year anniversary. So this was, be, uh, this was a little bit before that. Uh, but it was at a time when, so this was after Kennedy had been assassinated, just a few weeks. And then we decided to go down there. And, so the, what happened is then we decided we would travel as a pair. And this, this led to some very interesting encounters. 
And so we just we wanted to stay together because we were friends. So we said, well, where where would we where could we stay together in Birmingham? Remember, Bull Bull Connor was there, and it was against the law for blacks and whites to actually live. So we decided, well, the black YMCA, and it was a segregated YMCA, would take us. So we went there, the two of us, and said, oh, we'll uh, we'll take uh, we will we'll take a room together if we could, or just share a room or something. And they looked at me and said, we'll take him, but we taking you is a serious issue. So finally we convinced them to take me. But the idea was they, that I had to hide in the inner recesses. This is like uh, some, some maze where I was at the center and they could escape through the fire escape or something. And then we, as we got farther and farther south, we got caught in a snowstorm in a place called Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I don't know if anybody knows Hattiesburg. but Oh, you do? OK. Well, Hattiesburg was the last, I think was the last city in this famous book, which probably nobody's read, called Black Like Me. You ever read the book? You know the book. Anyway, it's a word. So then we were actually stuck in a snowstorm. We were going to go on to New Orleans and meet some friends. And anyway, I'm telling you a long story. And we were separated. The police said, you're not here to cause trouble, are you? And we said, no, of course not. And they carefully separated us. I got put, he got put in this great old hotel, which had antebellum furniture. It was for blacks only. And I got put in some wretched hotel by the uh, railway tracks. I'll never forget that. That was New Year's Eve, I think, uh, for... Uh, before uh, at the end at the end of 1963, and then we got to New Orleans and we got down to Bourbon Street and which was still segregated. So I saw this very firsthand and I was amazed. And then what amazed me too is I went I I just this was part of my consciousness. I wasn't working on this actively as a graduate student. I went to graduate school. And then I went back to New Orleans in 1971. So Bourbon Street, where my friend and I were walking up and down the street, I don't know you know the hawkers that are there. They get you to come in with the two of us there. Every time we were walking together, they would close the doors. We'd go up and down. We close, and we were doing it at probably the worst possible time because it was the night after the Sugar Bowl, and it was Ole Miss versus uh, Alabama. And so there we were, and we we didn't know who we were playing with, but these people were all drunk, so they didn't really notice. We got into a place that's still there, O'Brien's, you know, the the pianos, and they, there was no door, so we walked in. Then this waiter came up to us. He was black, and he said, you guys must be off the boat. And it made sense, because this guy had the facial markings of a Nigerian prince. You don't know what it is here. You guys are really playing with trouble. And then my friend got scared to death. And we, we could clearly see it. So that was 64. Seven years later, there's an American Economics Association conference in New Orleans. I walked down the same street, totally integrated. And I went around the south, and I said, this is amazing. So I said, how can you get this right? So I got fascinated with this again. So this is personal, went on too much of my own personal interest. But then this issue came. And then, then the question was a huge empirical question, which I thought was a challenge. 64 Civil Rights Act. Did it have a real effect? Well, Orly Ashenfelder and I had done some work on EEOC when I was a graduate student and started out my first job at Columbia. We, we worked on this, and we saw that the uh, for, that the EOC program, not the EOC, the uh, contract compliance program, had a moderate effect on, in promoting uh, employment. But there was a big controversy about Title, about the Title VII, 64. And the reason is, remember, 64 was just at the beginning of the Vietnam War. The economy was heating. So there were a lot of explanations out there saying, well, it was a tight economy and so on. So I viewed this as a challenge, a real challenge. And to be honest, I went into that study thinking that it probably wasn't the Civil Rights Act. Don't forget, I was doing this in Chicago. Uh, and uh, a lot of my colleagues were very hostile to the idea that any government program. So I went in and I battered away at this data for close to 10 years. And I found a number, we, we found new data. We had data. It turned out there was contract, there was data that uh, were collected by the state of South Carolina to measure compliance with the Jim Crow law. And so we could see that, you know, 64 was a real bell. We tried a lot of different methods. None of it. We kind of compared ourselves to Sherlock Holmes, and uh, uh, in the sense we tried to eliminate all possibilities. There wasn't, you know, there, there were a lot of other competing explanations. But in the end, we surrendered, and he said, "Look, this can't be. This didn't make me very popular among some colleagues, to be honest." But I, but in the end, I saw no other way but to write it up there. So it just became a challenge, and and then it, it to me it was very, very very fulfilling to actually see some evidence that supported the view. Because there was still a view at the time, I think, that the 64 Civil Rights Act was just, you know, an epiphenomena that really was the war. It really was the tight economy. And uh, uh, all those factors were going on. And they certainly, but don't forget, it was in the South, 
where the breakthroughs occurred. It was in certain industries that were actually most vulnerable to government uh, intervention and, uh, and, and, and to intervention. So to me, it actually told a story. And actually, I thought it was very, uh, I, I thought it was interesting. And I, it, gives, it really caused me, to, I mean, so this is a large empirical study. So I will say one thing. I feel that the, I've done a lot of large empirical studies. And I personally think that's my best work. I also know that's a minority opinion. <laughs> that those kinds of studies are just too tedious. And they involve, you know, you start going through eliminating this, eliminating that. Only the hardcore like that kind of study, right? And um, you're hardcore, so uh, you might like it. But, but no, but seriously, it, 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 it's not a flashy thing. You know, it's not like here's something, a, a meteor struck Earth, and there it was. And, you know, the dinosaurs were extinguished, and I see the iridium built. No, it wasn't quite that clean. But, but to me, it was very satisfying because, because we could really bring all kinds of evidence together, including anecdotal evidence. I mean, you could read reports. In the labor reports of the state of South Carolina, there were all these violations and all of these reports. And you read that, and that would inform the econometric study. So I personally think that's the way to do empirical work. But that's, I think, a minority view still, well, unfortunately. Well, as, as IPR director, I'll, uh, I'll tell you personally, um, you know, it, before I read that study, I thought I wanted to pursue a different field. And when I read that study, I went to, uh, I went to Bob Haveman and said, I want to learn how to do this type of work. Um, and that, that specific study was the thing that motivated me to change what the type of economist I wanted to be. So oh, that's I'm great. grateful to you oh, well, for that. I'm grateful for you. That's nice news. <laughs> So at, at the risk of uh, alienating Patricia, I, ha I have to ask one quick <laughs> additional question. Yes. I'm so sorry, Patricia. Um, she, she's the one who runs IPR, so I have to be really careful. Okay. Um, uh, so, so the one thing I, I, one thing I want to say it is very much about IPR, right, is when I think about social scientists who most embody the spirit of a place like IPR, you are one of the handful at the top of my list because of a number of reasons. I mean, really, it's the freedom with which you've drawn upon con concepts from other disciplines and the way in which you've contributed to other disciplines. So very briefly, because she'll kill me if, if uh, I'm already past time, you know, thinking about your own personal and career development, what do you think are some of the conditions that helped you become the type of scholar you are today in that regard? And what are maybe the biggest challenge you think you faced? In three minutes or less. OK. <laughs> You can have five. Well, I think it may be that I'm a dilettante, dilettante and, um, in the sense I am very curious about a lot of things. But I've actually had some very good colleagues. Lindsay, people who are in fields, Jack Hines. I mean, so for example, people across the spectrum, there's a great quote by uh, Hayek, I think, right? It's called, nobody can be a good economist who is only an economist. I think that's the thrust of Hayek's quote. There's a sense in which you really need I mean, you really need to just understand what the phenomena and also the interpretations. So I've always, you know, I have a liberal arts background. I felt, I feel strongly that, you know, there are multiple sources of knowledge, bright people. And, and, and the fact is that every field is, is limited. It's got a certain vision. And I think economics has opened up much more than it might have been opened up 40 or 50 years ago uh, to other ideas. I think it's just being, I was lucky to be exposed to a variety of really bright people, uh, very good people, people who are working on things that I, I thought was interesting. I remember talking to Lindsay when, when the bell curve was done, remember? Murray and Hernstein were basically claiming that uh, there was no way to change ability. The ability was genetically determined. And yet there was evidence already of the early childhood programs. Of the, or, I found that fascinating. Even they had evidence or at least Hernstein did in some program he had in Venezuela. So literally, if you started looking at the data, you realized that you know there really were other ways to think of it. I was very much fixated on test scores as a measure. I thought you know human capital and IQ were synonyms. And so when you learn and kind of see it, but you see, there's always a healthy skepticism too. I right? see, so say, okay, these people are okay, but they're weaklings methodologically. So I can always improve. That was the arrogance, and, and it helps too. <laughs> Because it helps no matter what they know, I can do it better than they can. Which isn't always true, but it also it fuels your curiosity to say, I can improve this field, and then you go into it. But I, I think it was broad, uh, broad engagement. I've, I've been with the American Bar Foundation, which is connected in some ways with the uh, 
with Northwestern, at least through faculty and uh, personnel. And uh, that's been a very uh, broadening experience in the sense of getting people from very different disciplines, very often disagreeing, and picking on economists and viewing them as narrow-minded. I think overstating economists as you know, assuming perfect rationality, total certainty, and, uh, and all kinds of things, which I think, don't think we do. I don't think we ever did, actually, but that's another story. But so, so I think it's just a question of how open-minded you are. And I've actually I've really felt it's important. Even though I've done a lot of talking, I much actually prefer to listen. I think it's listening is, is really good. And listening to people who, with whom you disagree, especially if they're intelligent, they have a position. At least you can dismiss the position and say, well, why is this true or why is it not true? And uh, to me, it's been very edifying across a range of fields in genetics. And I'm working with some primatologists uh, now, uh, and that's really taking me off the beaten path in a sense. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I didn't start out as a primatologist, and I'm not a primatologist, but we're looking at data collected by primatologists, and we can see, we can use these, these laboratories to understand how experience is modifying behavior and what the imprint is on gene expression. And to me, this is part of the same story, this, this story here. I'll go back to this story only because I, uh, think this is what I'm really all about, is really trying to understand exactly what the mechanisms are that promote this. And we can think of it in various ways. So I think actually interaction of game theory, game theory will be a vehicle for us redefining what we think of as personality traits in a very constructive way. We think about, so here, I'll run this by some experts here. I would think of personality as being something that easy, evolves from an interaction. Just like we were talking about scaffolding, I think it's a matter of the incentives in the situation, as well as the traits people bring, and then the interaction that occurs. So to me, it's not like a trait that's fixed. It's something that does switch, but it's not purely situational either. So it's neither this kind of extreme view, which usually has been the way things have been characterized, but that's a huge measurement challenge. And, and to me, you, I can learn from multiple sources, the behavioral economists, the personality psychologists, and individuals in, in game theory. So, you know, if you think about these questions, one thing I would say, since you want me to probably give, conclude very quickly, is that most, if they're graduate students in the room, most students have this notion that everything is settled. That's because the way we run seminars typically is with polished papers and people whose reputations or promotions depend on the quality of the paper. They never see any of the suffering and ignorance and, and futility that occurs with all of these drafts. And I think, uh, and I think that, that the advice that I would give is that probably for the students is to recognize how little we know. And I think that's probably, the trouble is there are a lot of things I'd like to know and I'm still trying to know. And I've been trying to know for decades. I'm not completely optimistic I'm gonna ever know, but I'm gonna struggle away. But I think that's the idea. You go at this with humility and uh, then you also realize you can learn along the way. There are little fragments we learn. To me, that's very edifying. It's a, but I think that's the idea that you should communicate to students. I think the seminar and teaching system, the teaching, we don't, we don't wallow in mud in our classrooms. Right? That's a very unsuccessful classroom. If you're teaching MBAs to wallow in mud, they will hate you. But I think you really want people to wallow into the ignorant and, and to under, if you could somehow take people through a project which you know, really leads them and to just kind of communicate this kind of feeling of hopelessness. I don't know any of this. And even what I thought I knew is wrong. And then to understand how you might live with it. To me, that's exciting. Once in a while, when you really get some little snag of understanding, but also realizing you'll never fully understand. So that's a too long an answer, and I'll stop. Uh, you know, I'm thrilled, though, because I see some of my former uh, people who were in my PhD methods class, and that's basically the goal of my, we just followed the whole time, right? And so, <laughs> in that regard, it's actually perfect. You've just uh, good research, validated my pedagogy. I think good research is wallowing. I think it's really <laughs> making mistakes. And the other part is just making sure that, uh, and, and being willing to take a risk. You take a risk. A lot of projects fail. I mean, that's, what's, that's what knowledge is about. That's what I get. Hopefully, it would be nice if tenure and most, uh, for most academics, were of that nature, where people said, now I'm tenured, I can take risks. Uh, others say, no, now I'm tenured, I can turn the cash register on. That's one, that's one response. Uh, that's one response. But there's another saying, well, now I can do the same thing for the rest of my life. 
And that's another danger. So the idealized tenure system would really have people taking risks and being guaranteed a little bit. At least they won't, they won't starve to death uh, from making a big mistake. And I think that's what, a, that's what a, ideally a university should do, right? So anyway. So thanks so much. So we have about 15 minutes before it's time for um, uh, uh, refreshments, which will take place just outside of here. Uh, before we go to questions, can we all just give Jim Heckman a big round of applause? <laughs> so we have microphones uh, spread around the room. Uh, please raise your hand, and, and, and uh, Jim, do you want to call on them? Or? You call on them. I'll call. Okay. <laughs> but ask Bob Gordon. I got, Bob's hand is up. I saw All it right. first. Okay, Bob, Bob's you're up first, friend. but you still need to identify yourself, Bob. Oh, okay. Bob Gordon, uh, Economics Department. Uh, let's look at your graph. Yes. I'd like you to look at the very upper left tail and tell me how to allocate resources between the first year of birth, the age of zero to one, and the age you mentioned, which was three to four, when these differences really start to emerge that lead to future poor social behavior. Uh, and is there any kind of ethical or moral issue about intervening in a family when the children are, say, right after birth through age one? You've thought a lot about this. I'd, I'm sure we'd all like to hear. Well, there are a couple of aspects to your question. I mean, there's a narrow aspect, which is saying, well, what exactly would you do? There's certainly a lot of evidence. I, I stopped my graph at age three because that measure isn't accurate below age three for that particular graph. But there are other measures of child development that suggest the very earliest years are really quite important. You can see measures of engagement. There are scores that I didn't put up which show some important differences are emerging even at the earliest years, the earliest months of life. So I would argue that on, on, on that evidence, that is strong. Now, if you were to say exactly how much should you intervene, how much, remember, this investment I'm talking about would be inclusive of government programs plus parent. It's really the net bundle. So a lot of kids are getting a tremendous amount of parental investment at, at, those, at those years. So it's the net program. So, so I'm talking, you know, so the actual number of investment well, this is something that hasn't really been fully quantified. If you think about what does a middle class mother do? How much time does she spend? You know, Tom Espenshade has estimated kind of the cost of raising a child. And he's broken it down into different stages of the child. So you can talk about foregone earnings, direct inputs, and so forth. There's a huge amount of investment that occurs in the earliest years. Just the time of the mother. And if the mother doesn't do it, usually, you know, contracting out quality time, especially for more middle class, upper middle class parents. So I think there's an enormous amount spent, and I think the evidence is suggesting that if anything, you know, when we think about effective early uh, education, the ratios of the number of children per pupil, really very small. I mean, very one, I mean, two, maybe three, at the earliest age, because they require a lot of attention. And then as you get older, I mean, there's less attention required. You can, you know, there are economies of scale, if you will. You have larger classrooms. So the early years are really very important. And uh, they're, very, they're very costly. Uh, and I think the full counting hasn't been made. I would put the family measurement on top of the, see, the government programs that we see and come at are only part of the story. They're a small part of the story. I would say the family investment is enormous. But people have not done the kind of home economics component that they should in terms of really evaluating. People have, I mean, Kuznets talked about this. You know, Nordhaus and Tobin, they talked about the value of time, value of household production. Periodically, there have been these studies. But not totally comprehensive studies of what's the value, period by period, of mother's time. I mean, that's something to be done. So the answer is I don't know. But I, I think I have some rough idea that at least it's ordered this way and that there are substantial advantages. So I don't know if that answers the first part of your question. The second part is one that's always there. And that's the family. So there's a, this, apparently it's true, although I actually, I, I think I checked this, so I think it is true, that in 1969, Walter Mondale proposed, right, a preschool program. And I think it was actually passed by the Senate. There was some version. And it was given to Nixon. This was 1969. And Nixon vetoed it. And Nixon vetoed it on the grounds that it was basically violating the sanctity of the family and you were intruding in the life of the child. 
that's a common objection that's made about preschool programs, that you're somehow intervening in the life of a child. I think that's a wrong perspective. To the extent that you actually did that and came in and said, this is what you must do, this is what value system you should adopt, that would be a disaster, and I would not favor. I think what, what would really be successful and what really would avoid that issue is really understanding that you want to work with the family, not replace it. It has to be voluntary. So I really believe it has to be voluntary. And it has to reflect individual values. So you could have groups of people, different, you know, Orthodox Jews, you could have Muslims, you could have um, uh, Mormons, you could have Jehovah's Witness, Southern, Southern Baptists. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, and different, ethic, different ethnic backgrounds, you know, Catholics from uh, France, Catholics from, uh, from uh, uh, Argentina. Very, so the point is, is you want to essentially res re respect those basic values that are created in those early years. But on the other hand, I think there's enough agreement across all of these groups about what the basic characteristics would be of what a successful child would be. I think very few families want their kids to be dumb. Very few want that, or unhealthy, or you know, violent criminals. So I think there, there is a baseline. I'll use Amartya Sen's word capabilities. I think Sen, that notion of capabilities, is the skill set. I think there's a universal agreement. I'm not going through all of Sen and Nusbaum. I'm talking just about personal skills. I think we have agreement on those. And that's enough of a basis. And then the rest of it should be tailored or should respect. So that's where I would engage the private sector, the public sector. I would bring in all kinds of religious and community elements precisely to adapt it. So it's not like some, some, some ethnic group telling some other ethnic group what to do, or some racial group telling some. It's basically saying, these are the tools. We can supplement family life. And that would create, I think, a powerful uh, counter to the argument you're raising, which is universal. I mean, it's still everywhere. People talk about this as saying, you know, we're, we're entering family life. And if we really were telling people you know, how their kids should be raised and what their values should be, There'd be a lot of truth to that. But I also think that we're not, or at least successful versions of these programs wouldn't go there. It would just say, we're trying to make the kids more, more capable. Let them be what they want to be. And then let the, you know, there might be extreme cases where parents are abusive or violent or something, in which case you do want to try to intervene with the child. I mean, John Stuart Mill wrote about that. It's a common issue, a big conundrum about what happens if parents really aren't interested in the well-being of children. But I still think that's a minority element. I really think so. And I think making things voluntary, it really can be very effective. Long answer. Uh, David Martzall and I uh, run the Center for Economic Progress and work on some policy issues. And I had to laugh when you mentioned Nixon in 69 vetoing uh, uh, universal pre-K, given uh, how much uh, some of the ideological positions of the various parties have uh, have wandered in different different directions since then? What would what would there be some surprises in recent years of uh, municipalities, cities, or states uh, where you've maybe testified or where you've had conversations with people where the ideology may be on one side and very conservative, but where actually they have adopted a lot of your thinking around early investments? And have you seen some things that kind of fly, you know, are a little outside the norm in a positive way for us to? But see, this is something, uh, it, it bothers me that, it, I mean, it's good that there has been an embrace. I mean, Hillary Clinton has been a very active supporter of early childhood since the time, at least since the time she was in the White House. She had a conference there. And that's good, so nothing wrong with it. But I think there is a problem here, which may be that this is viewed as a, as a political plank of one side or the other. Where I have seen, if you go to the states in the Midwest, like Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, these are programs, these are states where family value issues play and where economic productivity plays. I kind of downplayed it. But when we compute the rate of return, where we actually look at what the cost-benefit calculations are, counting the deadweight cost of collecting taxes and all, you're getting 7 to 10% rate of return on some programs, uh, lesser on more expensive programs. That actually resonates in a way that is across the, the political spectrum. And so it's not like saying this is red state or blue state issue. I think it's been interesting the places like Georgia 
Oklahoma and others have actually embraced this very actively. And part of it is that they're most concerned about family values. They're actually very concerned about the, the structure of, uh, of what the opportunities are for children. And they're worried about this divide. Children growing up in, in single parent families which are not nurturing to the, to the children. And so I think this is a broader issue. And it's played out that way politically. So in, in a lot of these areas, people that you'd normally, I was at a meeting in uh, Omaha a few years ago, two years ago actually, and it was partly supported by the Chamber of Commerce of Nebraska. And it was, and the governor was there. And these were people who were, I think it was predominantly Republican and it's political, I didn't do a, con, a careful assay, but I think it was pretty conservative by the kind of red state, blue state. But the issue was very strongly supported. It was high up on the agenda of the Chamber of Commerce. And it was for these, all of these reasons, the economic benefits. You know, it's the way that the issue is spun in some sense. People talk about social fairness. That's been a kind of a traditional modern liberal viewpoint, redistribution to the poor. And the, the quote, conservatives in this regard uh, would be thinking much more kind of building character and making sure that kids could, could function and, and supplementing families. But I think it comes to the same thing in this case. And that, that I think, is the universal appeal here. So without taking anything away from Hillary Clinton, she's now a declared candidate. What I worry is that people will say, oh, early childhood, that's Clinton, and that's a, that's a democratic thing. And I don't think... I don't think it is, I, I, at least locally, in, in places like uh, in many states and cities have actually adopted this, which we might think are normally very conservative. I mean, San Antonio, Texas, they had a big discussion. It was partly because they wanted to think of ways to improve a lot of their kids, you know, how they could make the next generation more productive. And it wasn't uh, red uh, versus blue. So I, I think it's more universal. But I don't know what you think, Lindsay. I know. I do worry about this, that it becomes too much an issue of a Democratic Party, or so, and I don't, don't think it should be. I really think it's apolitical, and that's the way I'd like to, 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 to couch it. It's more like building uh, infrastructure, a building a new transcontinental railway. I don't know, is that red state or blue state? I mean, you're talking about building infrastructure, and you're helping the next generation, and you're reducing inequality, and you're promoting social mobility. I don't know. I mean. You know, isn't Marco Rubio talking about social, Ted Cruz? I mean, this is an issue now that's in the campaign. Certainly, I think that this is apolitical. So it's not like I want to say, oh, it's too bad these people supported this. But I'm just worried that this, this kind of analysis could be painted too much into a political corner. And I really think it's apolitical. I don't think it's a political. I, I think it goes beyond politics. But that's why I, I, I think it actually is more. So I know that there are lots of questions. We're going to have a lovely reception, and I encourage people to, uh, talk, to, to talk with Jim at the reception. But before you all pack up, um, uh, there are a few things that are really important for me. First of all, um, it's an incredible privilege for me to be um, director of IPR uh, to uh, uh, be in an intellectual community where conversations like this are are so exciting. Jim, it was really, really fantastic that you could join us for the afternoon, and we hope you'll join us very frequently. Well, no, we I appreciate that. No, I, I appreciate that opportunity. I know I talk way too much. That's I guess fabulous. I was supposed to. No, exactly. uh, but no, I really respect the work of the people here. I mean, I've read a lot of the work, used a lot of the work. A lot of it's very exciting, and even when it's challenging or or, or maybe dissenting, it's it's at a very high level. And I do think it would be extraordinarily useful to. I, I have interacted with many people in this room, and I hope to continue more interactions and maybe foster them further. So thank you very much.